are delighted to be joined by the amazing singer, songwriter, Caroline Cobb. Hello and welcome to Expositive Word, Caroline. Hi, thank you so much for having me, David. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Caroline, if you could only be one of those things, would you choose to be a songwriter or a song singer? Uh, that um, That is really tough. Yeah. I would probably lean toward songwriter because... I really love, you know, using music to tell the stories from scripture. So that actual process of diving into a passage, trying to figure out how to tell that story through yeah. music is so fun to me. But yeah. I mean, singing it kind of completes the circle, singing yeah. stories over people. So it, that's a tough one. Yeah, it is. Well, we, we, we've we got a tough one out of the way. That'll get a lot easier from now. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Before we get into the questions, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, um, I am a singer-songwriter that, again, just I love using music to tell the biblical story, to tell that meta-narrative. Um, yeah. And the hope is that people can rehearse it and remember it as they're going about their everyday lives. So as they're commuting to work or changing a diaper or cooking dinner, whatever they're doing, that yeah. they, it can be something that they're marinating in. Yeah. Um, I've been married to my husband, Nick, for 15 years, yeah. and he is one of the pastors at our local church. We have three kids. They're 10, 8, and 6, and uh, yeah, that's that's me. Yeah, you sound very busy, Caroline. When on earth do you get a chance to write all of this music? <laughs> oh, gosh. I mean, honestly, when they were little, if yeah. they had any kind of Mother's Day out or time <laughs> in child care, I was writing music. Uh other things piled up, but I was writing music. And now they're all in school, and we have some family around us, so it's yeah. a little bit easier. Yeah. But, uh, but yes, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what I would do. <laughs> when did you first become become a Christian? Um, you know, I trace kind of my first real steps of faith back to my junior year of high school. Mm. Uh, that is, you know, I had kind of been around um, my parents – had put me in a Christian school. It wasn't, I didn't really grow up in a, in a household that was, uh, you know, talking about God all the time mm -hmm. or anything like that. We mm -hmm. went to a church that was probably a little bit more uh, social. Um, you know, there were a lot of stories about God, but yeah. I don't remember at least hearing the gospel and perhaps God just hadn't opened my eyes yet. But mm -hmm. it, when I was a junior in high school, I had been around the faith, but that was the first time that I, kind of made this decision to spend time with God and to pray. Yeah. And it's actually, it sounds uh, a lot more honorable than it was. What mm. actually happened was this speaker that at a camp that I went to said, if you, um, if you truly value God, you will think of something that you value and uh, make a pledge to spend time with God every day for six weeks. And if you miss even one day, you have to give up that thing that you value for six weeks. Yeah. Kind of like, sort of like a, making a deal. And it's not probably theologically what I would recommend yeah. like a youth pastor to <laughs> yeah. do. But yeah. at the same time, it worked for me because I really valued being able to drive my car. I had just gotten a car. Yeah. And uh, I said, I'll give up my car for six weeks if if I miss a day. And what it did for me was actually turn something that was a duty that I was just checking off so I didn't yeah. have to give up my car. Yeah. And I actually feel like the Lord was changing me by me just spending time with him and praying. Yeah. And it also set me up to be kind of countercultural. Like if I was with friends at a sleepover or something, I still had to read my Bible and pray. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it made me feel weird and it made me feel different. But yeah. I feel like God was strengthening my young faith. And so that's where I trace it back to. Um, but of course, God has been continually since then. Yeah. When did you realize that you had an amazing voice, Caroline? <laughs> um, that question is funny because <laughs> I, I'm i not so sure about the amazing voice part, but I appreciate that. I, To be honest, I've never really been, I didn't really grow up in a musical family. Um, I've never really been super confident in my voice per se, yeah. uh, but I was writing all of these songs and somebody needed to sing them. <laughs> so <laughs> I started singing yeah. and what's, what's been cool is that I feel like I have found my voice. Um, it might not be the kind of voice you hear, you know, singing out a big ballad on American Idol or something yeah. like that, but I just consider myself a jar of clay 
that is holding this great treasure. And so jars of clay by nature aren't perfect or, or squeaky clean or, you know, they're cracked and broken in places. But the point is not that I would impress people with my voice, but that they would see Christ through me, um, through this jar of clay. So I do feel comfortable in my voice, but I appreciate the question. I still don't ever think of myself as having this like, yeah, American Idol level voice. (laughs) Oh, wow. So can you remember when you became interested in songwriting? Yes, my um, when I was right around the same time I became a Christian, uh, my mom, she knew a little bit of guitar and she taught me a few chords on the guitar um, when I was in high school. And someone had played me a song um, that he had written. And I thought, hey, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could write a song. And so I came, I went home and I wrote, I think my first song and I just kept writing and it was, what was coming out was mostly songs of faith uh, because that was so important to me then, but I didn't really have, you know, a clear feeling of calling to continue to write songs. It was just something that I loved to do that helped me make connections, that helped me process, that helped me, you know, voice worship to God. And so I just continued to do that for a long time sort of almost privately only sharing with a few friends but I wrote a ton of songs all through high school all through college even into my 20s um that I hardly shared uh, but I was (laughs) writing all the time (laughs) yeah did any of them ever become public or any of those songs songs that we'd know today um you know you can probably google them and you could maybe find them but um and some of them are still out there because I did release a couple albums in that time yeah but I didn't really at that point I wasn't really pursuing this as a vocation and didn't really feel um, like a sense of direction or a sense that guy was calling to calling me to this beyond just a serious hobby. Yeah. yeah. Uh, But that kind of changed eventually. But yes, if you looked hard enough, you could probably find them. Although I'm not sure they're my finest work. Yeah. Well, that sounds like (laughs) a challenge to the listeners. If you find them, then make sure you take Caroline on them. (laughs) Yeah. Uh oh, please don't try too hard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what drew you to the idea of telling God's story through scripturally based songs? Yeah, I when I was about to be thirty, um, I was turning thirty on November eleventh, two thousand eleven. Yeah. So if you do the calculation, you can know my age. But <laughs> yeah. eleven, 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 and turning thirty, I thought, well, wow, that's a cool date, and that seems like a significant birthday. Um, I had this idea to make this goal, to make a songwriting goal. And I had loved uh, studying God's word ever since college and like really diving into scripture and understanding it and seeing the connections with the whole of the story. And I also obviously loved songwriting. And so it seemed like the perfect marriage to write songs from scripture. And what if I could write a song for every book of the Bible in one year? And so that was my goal. And I told some people about it and I just went for it. I had a spreadsheet that like helped keep me (laughs) accountable to doing it. And so, um, that year specifically, I think helped me just see these beautiful details in God's story. It was such a good fit for me because I loved, you know, thinking not only as like a teacher would, you know, what are the who, what, when, where, why kind of questions that I can ask here? What is the text saying? How can I be faithful to the main ideas of the text? But also I got to look at it like an artist or a songwriter, like, oh, how would I feel if I was in this person's shoes? Or what if I wrote this song from that perspective? Um, How can I say this in a really imaginative way that's still very faithful? And then, of course, the songwriter has these other tools like melody and chord choices and lyrics and alliteration, all these things that you can use to help tell this story. Um, So it was such a great year for me, and it really kind of launched me on this path of loving to use music to tell the story. And it feels like that's a a thing that's missing a little bit in this modern landscape of Christian music. And so it's been a really, really sweet thing to, to do that. Yeah. So good. Where do you think the passion came from to tell the stories of scripture through music? And how do you do that with imagination, artistry and faithfulness to the text? Yeah. I, um, I, I think 
I think we're all really shaped by story and I'm still kind of learning what that means. Yeah. But I, I think that everything in our culture is kind of telling a story and there are so many voices speaking at us right now. Uh, there's a million different narratives that yeah. we're kind of swimming in. Yeah. And so I really want to help people marinate in God's story and yeah. It tells us, you know, who we are. It tells us what our purpose is. It tells us what we're a part of, this bigger story that we're a part of. It tells us where we're going, what our, you know, what the urgent mission is. Um, and so I really am like this, I'm a big believer in getting truths from scripture, like from your head into your gut. Mm. You know, there's something about mm. pairing music with the truth mm. and that really gets it into our gut. Um, and I've kind of, said a little bit about it, but the how of it is I love to look at a passage just like an expositor would, yeah. um, asking those questions, letting the text speak for itself, letting scripture interpret scripture, not, not putting my own meaning onto it, but letting it speak, you know, for itself. And then, then I get to play with, once I've kind of done that, then I get to look at it again, like an artist and then yeah. like a songwriter, you know, yeah. Yeah. just use my imagination to help tell something in a beautiful way um, to help people see the connection to Christ. Like if I'm writing from the Old Testament, how is this fulfilled in Christ? And so maybe by verse three or by the bridge, we're talking about Jesus, even though it's an Old Testament story. Yeah. So I've I've loved doing that. I love it. Yeah, so good. I'm sure the listeners just like me have been picturing your spreadsheet, Caroline. Sounds, <laughs> so, sounds so good. What led to your goal to write a song for every book of a Bible in a year? Um, you know, I, again, I just kind of had heard of other songwriters making goals like yeah, that. Yeah. And I think for me, uh, well, I, I just, honestly, it kind of just came to me. And I think I it, it was kind of providential and God kind of, I'm sure, put that idea in my mind. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's really freeing to have some structure to yeah, say like, yeah. when I'm going to write a song about this today, because my pastor preached about, you know, Deuteronomy on Sunday and we're going through that as a church. So it's much easier to sit down and be like, I really want to write a song about this yeah. and start from a passage of scripture rather than, um, rather than just sitting down and be like, what do I feel like writing a song about today? Yeah. Uh, how do I feel today? What emotion do I feel? You know, just and I've written lots of personal songs too, but, um, that is, I think freeing to me to have that structure. And once I started having that goal when I was 30, now I just automatically kind of write that way. I don't necessarily have a goal, but I am always writing from scripture. Yeah. Um, and it's really, really enjoyable to me. I love an Excel spreadsheet. I can just imagine <laughs> the satisfaction of when you completed that last cell on that spreadsheet. What did that feel like, Caroline? It was good because, you know, there's like Nahum and yeah. Leviticus on there. And, I, you know, right in the middle, I was like, what did I get myself into? But the fact <laughs> yeah. that I had told other people yeah. that uh, I was doing this yeah. and then I had to, you know, factor in how many weeks are there in a year yeah. how many books are there in the yeah. bible again yeah. oh yeah oh gosh i gotta write a lot of songs <laughs> like at least a song a week yeah. so that spreadsheet kept me on track and it's funny to hear a creative say that they used a spreadsheet but i think i need a little structure sometimes or else i'll just never get anything done yeah so good <laughs> so so good how do you trace a concept or an idea when develop developing a new project and how does this translate when you play live yeah, um, often it starts with just writing a lot of songs, yeah. and then once I have sort of a bunch of songs written, I I feel like I start seeing some kind of theme come out in those songs, mm. and then once I have that big theme that I'm working with, I can fill in all the holes uh, about the whole story, or I can tweak some lyrics inside of a song to fill out that whole or to connect it to other songs. So like, for example, on, um, the first storytelling album that I did is called the blood and the breath. Mm. And the whole theme of that album was sort of death to life and redemption and that redemptive narrative. Um, but I noticed that there were no songs about the Holy spirit on the whole song. Um, even though maybe he was implied, but never explicitly about that. And I had a song about God breathing life into Adam and Eve mm. in Genesis. And I had a song about 
God breathing life into Ezekiel's vision, you know, the, the dry bones in yeah. his valley in his vision. So I wanted to have a song about that, that breath of God idea through the Holy spirit. So I wrote a song from acts two to kind of finish out that album. Yeah. And the point is at like a concert, I'm, I'll try to trace the story of scripture for everyone that's listening in the audience. So I'm really just like this vehicle for this bigger story, um, yeah. but doing it through music and giving context along the way. So the hope is that the people that are there listening can kind of be on this journey. And we'll start in Genesis yeah. and we'll end when Jesus returns. And through the middle, I might sprinkle in some personal things and stuff. But mostly we're talking about this big story that is our story. Yeah. And, uh, I'm hoping that people worship God through it. I'm hoping that people kind of are able to have a bird's eye view and remember, oh, yeah, that's the story that I'm part of yeah. um, and lift their gaze to him. So I love doing that at a, a concert. So if anybody's ever been to like Andrew Peterson's Behold the Lamb of God concert, it's yeah. his Christmas concert. Yeah. He kind of does that. It's just songs telling this biblical narrative of a king coming of Jesus coming and it starts at the very beginning and it ends at Christmas kind of, but mine is a little bit different because it's not as focused on Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. So good. What scriptures or theologians have influenced you the most? Gosh, that's really hard to, uh, yeah. I think, you know, I think the thing that's influenced me the most in terms of my songwriting is just studying the Bible with other people at our church. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, over time, like just that build up of studying the Bible, which, you know, we've done some over, over the years, I've done some Jen Wilkin Bible studies and Nancy Guthrie. Um, in terms of what I've read, that's really influenced me. I think Tim Keller makes a lot of, uh, light bulbs go off for me and yeah. he really challenges me uh, to think. And I really enjoy reading him, um, A.W. Tozer, John Piper. Yeah. And, just lots of different things that I gather, uh, yeah, gather yeah, in. Yeah. Uh, the, the author of uh, Amazing Grace, John Newton, mm -hmm. uh, he, Tony Reinke wrote us a, 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 like a book about him. And I, some of my songs have come out of that too. So, yeah. So Sorry, good. a lot of answers to your question. <laughs> yeah, that was brilliant. That's what <laughs> we love. A lot of things have influenced. Yeah, no, that's great. What parts of a Bible do you draw from the most? And what are your favorite passages and why? Um, well, for this new album that's about to come out, I drew quite a bit from Isaiah. Yeah. Um, I really love those passages in Isaiah where I think Isaiah is so wonderful for a songwriter because yeah. or an artist because there are so many images and one of those prominent images is this image of a wilderness yeah. or a desert yeah. or a barren wasteland blooming into a garden and like rivers streaming there and um so i wrote songs that kind of spoke to that yeah uh, i actually really like writing from the old testament because they're so image driven and those songs it's fun for me to point them forward to how like a passage or a story is fulfilled in Christ. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, any kind of story is really a narrative, like the narratives about Jesus and the gospels are really fun to write from because I love imagining what, what is it like to be in this story and yeah. then trying to put that into a song. Yeah. So good. You mentioned Andrew Peterson earlier on. You've been compared to him and to Rich Mullins and Sandra McCracken, Ellie Holcomb. What do you have in common with them and what music artists do you resonate with the most? Yeah, I do. I really resonate with Andrew Peterson and Santa McCracken, not just on a personal, what I listen to yeah. um, when my kids aren't telling me what to, we yeah. should listen to. <laughs> yeah. uh, although they like them too, but I resonate with their music quite a lot. I think Andrew is a great storyteller and he's got just this poetic way of, of putting lyrics together. But both of those artists, really incorporate a lot of scripture mm. into their songs mm. uh, and they do it in kind of an imaginative way not a hokey way and I also really appreciate how both of them they draw from scripture and from like life themes that are not necessarily like the easy pickings yeah. <laughs> or the yeah. low-hanging fruit yeah. 
the things you'd find on like a bumper sticker or something there there's sorrow and suffering and they might talk about lament they might talk about the old testament and just things like that that a lot of artists on the radio don't necessarily cover so i i really have been ministered to by both of them yeah yeah how important is singing to god and why do the words we sing matter well i think it's pretty i i think it's pretty important um what comes to my mind is Colossians 3.16, and it's just one verse of many, but it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Yeah. And then Psalm 33.1, which says, Shout for the joy, for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. It's yeah. it's fitting. It's a fitting thing to do um, when you've seen the Lord and when you've you see his beauty. And so I think it's important to sing to God because I think he commands it. Yeah. It's modeled in scripture, but it's also fitting. It's this appropriate overflow, a response to what he's done and who he is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think the words we sing matter because they are shaping us. Yeah. And I've heard someone say, I think it might have been Matt Papa say that, uh, worship music is the sermon that people remember. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it, it, there's something powerful about music that it has this power to get truth, you know, again, from our head to our gut to help us cling to it. Yeah. Um, and so that makes it all the more important what words we're singing. Yeah. Brilliant. What is the temperature of modern music today? And do you have concerns that a lot of popular worship music is linked in with ministries that teach a prosperity gospel? Um, you know, that's like a whole other conversation in some ways, but I do think that something I've noticed and kind of a soapbox that I have is that people are writing songs that seem, it seems like it's derivative of other popular worship songs. Like we're not actually saying much. Um, and what's disheartening is there's not as much use of our common language, which is scripture, you know, holding fast to the word of life, like you don't see a lot of like a wide range of scripture being used in worship songs. You know, it's just like maybe this verse here and this verse there allude to this, allude to that, but there's not as much of a range. And so when I'm leading worship, um, I'm not the main worship leader at our church, but if I ever get to lead worship, it's really hard to find songs about things like obedience, uh, it's really hard to find songs about missionary work or being on mission and giving your life away. It's hard to find lament. It's hard to find songs that are really biblical about justice or Psalms or it's, it's really hard to find songs about God's holiness and like our, how we should be in awe of him. But it's a lot easier to find songs that talk about fear or God's love or asking for like a experience of God. So it's not necessarily that those things are bad. It's just that we have to have a balance and a robust um, range of songs so that our people are formed into robust Christians that both know that God loves them, but also have a right view of God as holy and they, they, they see the reverence that's needed and, they want to give their lives away and they know that God wants to alleviate their fears. Yeah. So it's, it's to me, that's, it's a little hard to speak to because I don't listen to a ton of just the popular Christian radio stuff yeah. or get into the nitty gritty of all that. But, yeah. Um, yeah. but I do find that it's hard to find songs that, that cover the range of what it means to follow God or what is found in scripture. So yeah. Yeah. there's a lot of books that, there's hardly any songs that touch on those books <laughs> yeah, that's right. and, and from Leviticus and it's tough to write a song yeah. from Nahum, but, yeah. um, but I think it's important. Yeah. Brilliant answer. So good. You recorded your new album, A Seed, A Sunrise, right before the COVID-19 pandemic took the world stage. How do the themes of the album fit into this narrative? Yeah, I think we recorded just like the month before Um, in February of 2020 is when we were in the studio. And here in the States, at least March was really the time where it all just hit, um, where everything shut down. And 
I think the events of 2020 have really primed us for Advent. And I think what I mean by that is, um, and this ad, this album is meant to be an Advent record, yeah. uh, but it's reminded us again and again and again, wave after wave of reminders of like our collective brokenness, um, our mortality, our, our lack of control. Um, it's Advent is about both rejoicing over Jesus's first arrival and remembering that, but also aching for his second arrival when all that is broken is made new and there will be no more death, no more tears, no more crying anymore. And I think a lot feels really broken right now. And we don't often feel that during the Christmas season. We feel kind of this push to have this warm, fuzzy thing, but I think that's going to feel kind of dissonant this year. And so my hope is that this album gives voice to this ache over broken things um, even as it points us toward our hope in Christ and the joy of his coming. Yeah. Um, we, I think both of those things are present on this album. There's a lot of groaning, but there's also a lot of hope and a lot of joy. And I think the joy is all the brighter and all the more beautiful when we actually recognize the darkness and recognize uh, the ache. Yeah. What is your favorite song on the album? And what are you most looking forward to playing to a live audience? Um, that's a tough one too, because I mean, I, I always try really hard to be uh, proud of every single song (laughs) going into the recording process. I want them to all be strong, you know? Um, but I really love, I've played it a few times for people, but there's a song called joy as far as the curse is found. That's really upbeat and joyful and really fun to play live. Um, and but I have some other favorite songs that are a little bit more, you know, reflective of that groan. Mm. Um, one is called There Will Be a Day, which draws from Isaiah 2 and some other passages in Isaiah. And it looks ahead to the day when Jesus returns. And it's really rich in terms of just drawing from a lot of scripture. Yeah. And I love that. And there's something both longing and hopeful about it. And so... That's, you know, again, that's what I'm excited about with this album is that I really had no idea how much people might need yeah. Advent this year. Yeah. Um, it's like this time dedicated to say to God, how how long and please come and yeah. we need you and we want your kingdom. We want you to be our king. Yeah. And it's a time where we can voice joy and hope because we have this unwavering um, hope in Christ. Mm. Do you ever get nervous when singing live? Oh, yes and no. Sometimes. Um, <laughs> I I get most nervous at like people's weddings or something like that, where yeah. you only are singing one song and yeah. you can't say, oh, I messed up. You can't do that. Because at a concert, <laughs> yeah. if I mess up, I can just be funny about it. Yeah. And I usually mess up at least once. Um, <laughs> but uh, so what makes me not as nervous is knowing that – that idea again of me being this jar of clay with a treasure. And so whenever I think that way, whenever I think it's not about me, um, it's about this story Mm -hmm. and I just get to be this channel, uh, you know, that old hymn, it says, um, may they forget the channel seeing only him. And so I, I'm just a vehicle for a channel for this story. That's so much more impressive uh, and glorious than I could ever be. And so that, that really takes a lot of pressure off. And so I'm thankful for, for that kind of mindset when it comes to doing things for the kingdom. So of course I want to do it well. I don't want to mess up. I want to do it as excellently as I can. I practice, I rehearse, but at the end of the day, you know, it's not really about me and that makes me a lot less nervous, but yes, I do still get nervous, especially when I'm playing in front of a bunch of people I don't know or something like that. Yeah. So good. What resources have been most helpful to you in helping you grow in your faith, Caroline? Um, you know, I mentioned it earlier, but I really do think that Bible studies at my church, yeah. uh, the <laughs> the women's Bible studies that I've been at, we've been at several different churches because we've just moved towns a lot. But yeah. anytime I can get with other people, um, for me, it's been with other women and just talk through scripture and share our lives kind of with scripture as the foundation that has been super helpful for me. And it's just been a slow, uh, 
I think Jen Wilkin talks about it as like slowly depositing money into your account. You yeah, know, it's not yeah. like I have these huge aha moments, but it's these slow deposits yeah. of God's word that have really added up over time. So I think that's been my most my biggest resource um, yeah. has been that for sure. Yeah, brilliant. You mentioned that you don't always get control over the uh, playlist, but what, when you do, what type of music or artists are on your playlist that you listen to at home? Yeah, um, I do. I mean, I've I've said it already, but I do really like Andrew Peterson and yeah. Sam McCracken. And yeah. It's kind of like whenever they have new music coming out, I'm almost positive I'll enjoy it and yeah. that it will be something that will build me up and equip me and encourage me as I listen. And so I love them. Um, there's, you know, there's lots of others that I like a lot as a family though. We really like need to breathe. Yeah. Um, that's like probably our favorite band as a family. And then yeah. drew Holcomb, John Mayer, my kids love Hamilton. Yeah. So <laughs> things like that, um, are, are playing often in our house. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying to steer my kids toward quality quality music uh but yes they do like to have control of the playlist and sometimes they pick crazy stuff that they heard at school and yeah. i'm like okay we're listening to pancake robot but that's okay <laughs> i wish i wrote that so. yeah. what's your go-to karaoke song oh i like this question that's that's very funny um so i i used to always sing i will survive oh yeah yeah there's yeah. there's a um, there's another one that I really want to sing that I've sung a couple times, but I kind of want to make it my new go-to. It's part of their world from The Little Mermaid. Yeah, that yeah. was my favorite movie growing up, and we sang that all the time, and I know every single word. Yeah. So, see, that's the power of music is that I still know every single word to part of their world from yeah. Little Mermaid. Yeah, brilliant. Caroline, congratulations <laughs> on your new album release. We're cheering you on from over here in the U.K., What's the Thank best? You so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. What is the best way for people to connect with you, Caroline? Yeah, um, I think all the normal places, like just joining in my email list uh, and then social media. I'm on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter occasionally, but mostly Instagram. Um, and I love connecting with real people. That helps me. <laughs> yeah. That helps me remember that there are real people out there being you know, ministered to. Because sometimes, as an artist, you send something out into the world and you yeah. don't know what it's doing. Sure. Um, so that's that's really great for me to be able to connect. Awesome. Well, we'll put the links to your new album and to all of your social media accounts into your email list in the description below. Caroline, thanks again for your time. I really enjoyed speaking to you. Yeah, I enjoyed talking to you too, David. Thank you for having me. Thank you.